But seeing Balaram smile, Krishna thought that Balaram had understood his mind in observing the breasts of the gopis, and he immediately became bashful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, this is a family show, so we're not going to discuss too much about this. <laughs> but Balaram thought that, oh, these cowherd men, they don't know how strong Krishna is. They think he's just an ordinary boy. They don't know actually who he is. Krishna took it the other way. Oh, Balaram knows. <laughs> Because Krishna didn't like to discuss his affairs, even with Balaram. Uh, we, we talked about that yesterday. Number 37, protector of surrendered souls. Krishna is the protector of all surrendered souls. Some enemy of Krishna was enlivened with the thought that he didn't need to fear Krishna, because if he simply surrendered unto him, Krishna would give him all protection. Krishna is sometimes compared to the moon, which does not hesitate to distribute its soothing rays, even on the houses of the Chandalas and other untouchables. You know that story from uh, Ramayana, that when Ravana's brother uh, had had enough of Ravana's nonsense, he could see Ravana was leading the whole kingdom to destruction. Uh, what was his name? Vibhishan. Uh, Vibhishan, yeah that he approached Lord Ramachandra and he said, I want to I want to come over to your side. This rascal Ravana is, is you know, he's crazy. <laughs> and so all the, the monkeys and the bears that were with Lord Rama, they were saying, no, no, don't trust this guy, he's a Rakshasha, you know, he can lie and, you know, maybe he'll cheat us, maybe he's a spy, and you know, like they were going on and on. And uh, so Lord Rama, Rama then said something very wonderful. He said, anyone who even one time sincerely prays to me that, oh my Lord, I am surrendering completely unto you, and now I am yours, and please give me protection. He said, to anyone like this, from that moment on, I protect him completely. And my promise never proves false. It's very, very wonderful uh, statement. Uh, expresses this quality that he's the protector. Uh, he says, "Paritranaya uh, sadhana." I come to protect the, the devotees. Oh, and by the way, Dushkutina. <laughs> uh, yeah, Vinasaya Chadushkutam, that I also come and kill the rascals. <laughs> but that's secondary. Mainly he comes for his devotees. Uh, he loves his devotees so much that he likes to be with his devotees always. And on account of that, he's always present and he's always protecting them. Number 38 is happy. Any person who is always joyful and untouched by any distress is called happy. As far as Krishna's enjoyment is concerned, it is stated that the ornaments which decorated the bodies of Krishna and his queens were beyond the dreams of Kuvera, the treasurer of the heavenly kingdom. The constant dancing before the doors of Krishna's palaces was not to be imagined even by the demigods in the heavenly kingdom. In the heavenly kingdom, Indra is always seeing the dancing of the society girls. But even Indra could not imagine how beautiful were the dances being performed at the gates of Krishna's palaces. Gauri means white woman, and Lord Shiva's wife is called Gauri. The beautiful women residing within the palaces of Krishna were so much whiter than Gauri that they were compared to the moonshine and they were constantly visible to Krishna. Therefore, no one can be enjoying more than Krishna. The conception of enjoyment is beautiful women, ornaments, and riches. And all of these were fabulously present in the palaces of Krishna, defeating even the imagination of Kuvera, Lord Indra, or Lord Shiva. 
Not even a slight distress can touch Krishna. Once some of the gopis went to the place where the brahmanas were performing sacrifices and said, Dear wives of the brahmanas, you must know that not even a slight smell of distress can touch Krishna. He knows no loss. He knows no defamation. He has no fear, he has no anxiety, and he does not know calamity. He is simply encircled by the dancers of Braja and is enjoying their company in the Rasa dance. This is Krishna. This is Krishna. Uh, he has no unhappiness whatsoever, no, no conception of personal distress at all. Nothing can harm him. Nothing can uh, reduce or change or compromise his position, his supreme position. And guess what? We, the spirit souls, the jivas, are actually like that too. Like Krishna explains in second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, that we are immortal, indestructible, unchangeable, and always the same. There's never a time when we did not exist, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So, what is there to worry about? What is there to be distressed about? Well, actually, any cause of distress or any uh, unhappiness that we experience is simply because we are falsely identified with this body. Yeah, there's some dirty thing in the heart, uh, some misconception, some misunderstanding, some ignorance. And this is the cause of our distress. Because if we actually understood the position, that we are eternal, immortal, indestructible, unchangeable, and that Krishna is our constant friend and comes with us everywhere that we go, protects us, huh? helps us, loves us, does everything for us. If we actually understood the position, then we would never be in distress, we would never be in anxiety, we would never be in pain, or we would never be in suffering. Pain is inevitable. Huh? Because we are in these bodies, in this material world, and some things will happen to this body and we'll experience pain. No, that's going to happen. But suffering is optional. Suffering means that I identify with this body and then I think when this body is hurt that I am hurt. No, this is an illusion. This is ignorance. The only reason we suffer is due to this ignorance this illusion that I am this body. Actually, I am the spirit soul. I am pure consciousness, completely different from this body. I am eternal. The body is temporary. I am spiritual. The body is material. See? I can never be hurt or killed. And the body is always being hurt and, and is definitely going to die someday. So, we are different from this body. We're only living in this body just like a person living in an apartment. And then uh, when our lease is up, we get out of that apartment and we go find another apartment. See? It's like that. Or a person riding in the car. Uh, even if the car gets in a collision and it gets all banged up, we simply get out and we go in another car and then we continue on our way. So that's the relationship between the soul and the body. Soul and body are incompatible. They're like oil and water. They never really mix. So we should be convinced of this and we should practically understand it by realization also. Then there's no more suffering. Right? No more lamentation. <clears throat> Number 39. Well-wisher of his devotees. It is said of Krishna's devotees that if they offer even a little water or a tulsi leaf in devotion to Lord Vishnu, Lord Vishnu is so kind that he will sell himself to them. You see? How kind. Krishna's favoritism toward his devotees was exhibited in his fight with Bhishma. When Grandfather Bhishma was lying at the point of death on the bed of arrows, Krishna was present before him, and Bhishma was remembering how Krishna had been kind to him on the battlefield. 
Krishna had promised that in the battle of Kurukshetra, he would not even touch a weapon to help either side. He would remain neutral. Although Krishna was Arjuna's charioteer, he had promised that he would not help Arjuna by using any weapons. But one day Bhishma, in order to nullify Krishna's promise, exhibited his fighting spirit so magnificently against Arjuna that Krishna was obliged to get down from his chariot. Taking up a broken chariot wheel, he ran toward Grandfather Bhishma as a lion runs toward an elephant to kill it. Grandfather Bhishma remembered this scene and he later praised Krishna for his glorious favoritism toward his devotee Arjuna, even at the risk of breaking his own promise. Well, we've discussed this several times. And this is a wonderful quality of Krishna. See, an ordinary moralist